Hello, folks. Uh, welcome to the TDC webinar on community wealth building. We're just letting people in now. So welcome to you all. Good morning. Good afternoon. Coming in, wait a few more minutes, a few more seconds, minutes. We'll give it to two past the hour, I think. Hope you're all comfy. Get a drink. Ready to go. <laughs> now, we've got a little poll to start off just to get an understanding of what field you're from. So, Silly, if you could just put that poll up, that'd be neat. Just want to know a little bit about yourselves. Pop it in from all across the states and internationally. You getting that poll up, silly? There we go. Just fill that in for us, please, if you don't mind. Just give you a minute or so to make a choice. Fantastic. When people coming in, you've got a poll in front of you folks for new arrivals. Just fill that in for us if you could. That'd be great. This is the TDC webinar on community wealth building. Okay. I think that'll do for now. And we'll, we'll maybe put the poll up later on, Silly. But let's get let's get cracking. Well, welcome everyone. I'm the let's welcome everyone. I'm the moderator for today. I'm the Senior Fellow for Community Wealth Building globally at the Democracy Collaborative. Uh, I'm advancing community wealth building in the UK, Scotland, Europe, Europe, Australasia, and here in the United States. In terms of brief framing, before we get cracking, um, with climate crisis, pandemics, racial, economic, and social injustices, we need a big response. Uh, we know the problems. It's sourced back to an economy that doesn't work for us, our people, or our planet. Our economy extracts wealth from our communities, and whilst a few do very well, extraordinarily well out of wealth, uh, many do not. So community wealth building is about rebuilding the foundations for a good life for everyone everywhere. It's about rewiring the economy. We at TDC believe that we need to action things now. There's no time to waste. The big alternatives are known. We know the sad story. We now need to build a new story, a new chapter for an economy, a story that intentionally and deliberatively shows the way. And we believe that community wealth building is that way. Today, you will hear from our TDC, our TDC uh, the Box of Collaborate President, Ted Howard, and you'll have a brief history of community wealth building, the crisis moment we are in, and the transformation required. Then you will hear from our Director of Community Wealth Building, programs, my good colleague, Sarah McKinley, who will detail our community wealth building method and approach. Then I'm pleased to announce we have three great representatives from locations we've been working. Uh, we have Candice Moore, who's the Chief Equity Officer with the City of Chicago. Hello, Candice, who, has, who asked us to leave after a contribution, but there will be time for questioning of Candice. Then we have Hilary Abel, who's the Co-Founder and Chief Policy Officer at Project Equity, 
who I've been working with in Alameda County in California. And then last but not least, we have Mayor Jamie Kinder from Meadville in Pennsylvania, who also we've been working with. There will be plenty of time for questions, so post that in the chat or in the Q&As. So let's get going. Uh, over to Ted Howard, the president of the Democracy Collaborative. Ted, the floor or space is yours. Great, thank you very much, Neil. Hi, everyone. It's good to be with you. I wish we could be together in person. I know there are people all over the United States and from some other countries. Uh, I'm coming to you today from my home in uh, Denver, Colorado, the Mile High City. Um, community wealth building is a term um, and an economic framework that we at the Democracy Collaborative first articulated uh, back around 2005, 2006. And it really emerged more than a decade and a half ago uh, to challenge the underlying logic and failures of the trickle-down economic development model that's practiced in cities and states across all over the United States and in many other countries. Uh, before describing uh, some of the principles of community wealth building, um, I thought it might be useful to give you a bit of the history, uh, both of our involvement and even the precedents before the Democracy Collaborative became involved. So, Celia, if you could put up the first slide. Um, this is a slide, uh, very briefly, of um, uh, the journey we've been on at the Democracy Collaborative. We were founded in 2000 as a research center at the University of Maryland. Uh, but we became a nonprofit organization with our own board and so forth fairly quickly. For the first decade or so of our uh, existence, we really researched um, alternative economic models at the community level, both in the United States and in uh, other countries. So we began looking at employee ownership, community land trust, community finance, cooperatives, and so forth. A real change in our evolution happened around 2010-2011 when, at the invitation of the Cleveland Foundation, uh, we uh, started the first model, on-the-ground model, of uh, community wealth building in the form of um, uh, the Evergreen Cooperatives. This involved the city government, philanthropy, major anchor institutions, uh, you see a picture there of the first business launch, the Evergreen Cooperative Laundry. We began with five employees and one business. Today, there are more than 250 worker owners in the Evergreen Cooperatives. Uh, there are seven businesses, and it's a very successful employment opportunity and wealth building opportunity. Evergreen, in turn, inspired other communities around the country to begin experimenting with their own uh, uh, community wealth building models. Here you see uh, the Thunder Valley um, Community Development Corporation on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota, where the Oglala Sioux work to create jobs and build wealth in, uh, in a community that has extremely high unemployment and is ravaged by uh, it, hundreds of years of disinvestment. In 2015, uh, Community wealth building uh, went across the pond to the United Kingdom, where the city council of a community named Preston, an older industrial city in the north of England, began a very multifaceted community wealth building strategy that over time took Preston in just seven or eight short years from one of the uh, most deprived communities in all of England to uh, one of the most improved and better places to live in the North. That in turn inspired community wealth building uh, strategies and models all over the United Kingdom. Uh, Scotland uh, and North Ayrshire has one of the most robust to the state. And indeed the Scottish uh, government is now um, preparing a community wealth act that will be introduced as national legislation next year. And then finally, uh, and today we have representatives of us from local government, city and county, um, who are going to talk about the community wealth building uh, efforts that they have underway that we've been partnering with them on. Uh, Celia, if you could take down that slide, please. 
So while the specific term and framework of community wealth building is fairly recent, uh, there are many, many uh, uh, antecedents to community wealth building that span literally thousands of years that have come together in this moment. So as we sit here, we are part of a grand tradition, a human tradition. And let me just give you some of it. Uh, in the Old Testament, to go way back, the book of Leviticus speaks of the year of Jubilee. That was a time every 50 years when all the slaves and prisoners were to be freed in Israel, when all debts were to be forgiven, and when all property would be redistributed equally. And this was to happen every five decades. Traditionally, indigenous communities in the United States and in North America believed that land should be held in common by the whole people of their tribe. In England in the 1840s, the Rochdale Cooperative Pioneers built the first consumer and worker cooperatives in the face of the growing industrial revolution that was displacing so many people from their jobs. In our country, in the United States South, after our Civil War, freed slaves and their descendants began cooperatives, and later during our Civil Rights Movement, black farmers created early forms of land trusts in the South. In the state of North Dakota, interestingly one of the most conservative states in our union, uh, in the early 20th century, the progressive movement led to the establishment of the Bank of North Dakota, a socialized state-owned financial institution of, by, and for the people of the state, not for investors. Large-scale worker cooperatives of Mondragon in Spain, where tens of thousands of people own the companies they work in, in Emilia Romana, in that region of Italy, in the co-op networks of Quebec in Canada, the rural electrical cooperatives that were built in the U.S. during the Great Depression. And I could go on and on, but there's a grand tradition of democratizing ownership over capital in the United States. So what's the relevance uh, to today? Ownership and control of assets is the foundation of every political economy and largely determines who has access to wealth and power and who does not. In the United States, it's a well-known fact that asset ownership is concentrated to an extraordinary degree. As a former president of our Federal Reserve Bank warned in 2018, the United States is developing into a plutocracy. The COVID-19 pandemic has only exacerbated this trend. U.S. billionaires have seen their wealth surge $1.8 trillion during the pandemic, their collective fortune skyrocketing by nearly two-thirds. So wealth is being concentrated, and we need to move beyond economies that consistently generate every, ever greater wealth inequality and are overwhelmingly shaped and driven by the needs of capital investors rather than labor, working people, and communities. To address this growing wealth inequality, we need to build wealth in our communities. Creating an economy where assets are broadly held and locally rooted over the long term so that income recirculates locally, creating stable prosperity. Doing this requires us to develop plural forms of ownership across the full spectrum of assets. And by that I mean cooperatives, community land trusts, municipal ownership, anchor institution procurement strategies, public banks, community-based financing. These are not theoretical. They actually exist all over our country and they extend community ownership and control over capital and economic assets while also helping individuals and families grow their wealth. We're faced with a stark choice today, and Celia, if you could put up my final slide as I conclude. Do we continue with the economy we have now, what we would call it the democracy collaborative and extractive economy, or work to build a new democratic economy? What we're looking at on this slide is two fundamental paradigms of how to organize an economy. The old, the extractive economy where wealth is held tightly by increasingly fewer and fewer individuals, where work is treated as a cost on the balance sheet and labor on the balance sheet. And the concept is how can we create companies that have fewer and fewer workers? 
where business enterprises are solely focused on maximizing shareholder value with little ownership concerns for the people who work there, or building a new democratic economy, a community and broad-based ownership economy, an economy where workers are invested in, where communities are preferenced, where we realize that the fundamental uh, nature of our political democracy requires that we infuse our local economy with democratic principles. Community wealth building, this is my last comment, um, and you can take this slide down, Celie, thank you. Community wealth building's truly transformative potential is that it takes a full system view. It seeks to build an entirely new economy. The goal is not to simply build one-off projects, a co-op here, a social enterprise there. These are good things, but insufficient because they tinker around the edges of the problems that we have, and they don't change the outcomes that our economies are producing, at least for most people. So instead, we want to pursue fundamental changes to the ordinary operation of our local economies, of our systems, to literally rewire them in ways that were described on that chart, such that they produce reliably positive outcomes of the kind all of us on this call would want. So this is the opportunity before us and part of this grand tradition dating back many, many hundreds of years. I'd like to invite my colleague, Sarah McKinley, our Director of Community Wealth Practice, to share with you the new strategy that we are implementing in part partnership with communities to advance deep transformative community wealth building as a stepping stone to a truly democratic economy. Sarah? Thank you, Ted, and thank you to everyone, to our team, uh, Neil, and to Celia and Isaiah, and of course to our speakers. Um, I know we're, I know everyone's trying to get into the chat and, and talk to one another, so we're figuring out what the uh, technical glitch is, and we'll get that sorted, so, so please stay tuned. And of course, there'll be many ways for us to continue this conversation and be in dialogue with um, each other after this. So again, thank you so much for being here. Um, it was quite a whistle-stop tour, uh, Ted, um, and a great rich history. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about, well, how do you do this? Because it's absolutely true that we need to, to rewire our economy, and that's what community wealth building is. But, but what does that mean? How do we do that? What, what actually is community wealth building? We, we talk about community wealth building in terms of direct community ownership and control of assets in place. And our goal now is to really move a lot of the activities that do that from the fringes to the mainstream of economic development. Um, so Celia, if you could please, uh, uh, my first slide. Um, uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we talk about how, how to do that in place. And we talk about what we call the five pillars of community wealth building. Uh, please, next slide, Celie. These five pillars are all dimensions of wealth and within them are different interventions into, way that, into the way that wealth circulates within our community, a way to redirect wealth um, to the benefit of people and place. So first we talk about the progressive procurement. Public and institutional purchasing of goods and services are a huge part of our local economies. So how do we ensure that that money is recirculating within our economies, excuse me, within our communities and benefiting the people who live there and work there and create that wealth in the first place? So redirecting the spending of local uh, governments and local institutional actors to connect to local businesses and especially democratically controlled businesses in the community. Land and property. Land is a huge wealth generation, uh, generating asset in our communities. So how do we, how can public land and community land be used for, for putting productive use um, of that land and property back to community benefits? Things like community land trusts um, in our communities are very common. That's one way that we can do that within, within a community wealth building framework. Fair work. Our own labor generates wealth. So how can we ensure that we're benefiting from the wealth that we're creating 
by ensuring living wages and secure unionized jobs for workers, while also creating opportunities to work for workers to have greater control over their work environment through new employee ownerships and new democratic forms of governance. Next slide, please, Celie. Inclusive and democratic enterprise is a huge part of a community wealth building approach. A thriving economy needs diverse enterprise forms that meet the needs of people in place at different scales. Everything from cooperatives, all kinds of cooperatives, consumer, producer, employee owned cooperatives, social enterprise, democrat democratically controlled public enterprise. These are all various forms of ensuring that we have a diverse and, and inclusive enterprise uh, landscape. And finally, locally rooted finance, which ensures that the wealth that is being created through the assets recirculates in a way um, uh, that is investing in the real economy in place, investing in the people and the enterprises that live there. Things like community development, financial institutions, cooperative banks, public banks, things of this nature. So what does this all mean? Um, Celia, please, next slide. Community wealth building brings all of these interventions in each of these pillars together in an interconnected way that makes them greater than the sum of their parts. As Ted was just saying, these are great interventions, but for too long they've been um, separated from one another and are tinkering around the edges. We really need to connect them in a really concerted way. And we do that through what we call the community wealth building wedge with supportive policy resources and connectivity that helps these interventions scale in a way that they can truly move from the fringes to the mainstream and disrupt and ultimately displace the extractive economy. Think about locally, local purchasing, supporting local employee-owned cooperatives that provide good, fair work to people living in the community and share a profit share to those people working there, but also is located on perhaps once derelict land or public land that hadn't been being productive, productively used and is supported by revolving loan funds that help these enterprises to grow and continue to build capacity and meet needs in place. So how do we actually support this movement? How do we move this movement forward? How do we ensure that that kind of enabling infrastructure connects these various interventions and, and scales them in an appropriate way? The Democracy Collaborative believes that local government has a key role to play in creating that enabling infrastructure that connects community wealth building and helps it thrive through policy, resources, and standard setting. Over the last year, we have been working in four different places, um, and you'll hear from a number of them today. We chose to work with these specific areas because they're indicative of many of the challenges that Americans are facing, the challenges that Neil and Ted already spoke about, racial, social, economic, climate injustices. So we've been working in the city of Chicago, which is a large city um, that has serious problems related to segregation and race inequalities. Needville, Pennsylvania, a small town in, in a post-industrial area of Western Pennsylvania. Somerville in Massachusetts, that's high density and facing the pressures of gentrification. And Alameda County in, uh, uh, north, of Cal uh, north of San Francisco in California that is really struggling with the impacts of the climate crisis and land speculation. So each of these places have distinct challenges, but also distinct learnings that we can pull to build um, responses and, and interventions for the movement. So we at the Democracy Collaborative have been engaging in a process of, of resource, research and ex exploration with these four areas, producing action plans where we can connect, we can examine and connect existing activity on the ground and then offer recommendations for how to advance, scale and grow these opportunities. We're now looking to develop the resources and material that build the movement and connect um, uh, the movement in a powerful way. Networks of practice to share learning and a te technical assistance task force that Hillary Bell is a member of and will speak to later to really bring the specific expertise that is needed to deliver things like employee ownership conversion and spend analyses to really build the capacity to deliver on these actions in place. If we come together as a movement and use all of these capacities, we truly will be greater than the sum of our parts. And we're really excited to be here today to celebrate that. So um, looking forward to hearing from everyone and thanks for being here. Neil, back thanks to you. Much. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Sarah. That's great, thank you very much. Um, so now Sarah talked about the areas we've been working with and we've got 
three people to, to, to share some thoughts with us today. Um, first up is Candice Moore, who's the Chief Equity Officer at the City of Chicago. Um, Candice has to go at uh, 40 past the hour, so she's going to speak for 10 minutes, and then I'm looking for sort of questions or any thoughts to Candice after that. So, Candice, the floor and space is yours. Over, over to yourself. Uh, thanks so much, Neil, and thank you Pleasure. everyone for having me. Um, again, my name is Candace Moore. I bring you greetings from the city of Chicago, Illinois, where the weather is beautiful. Uh, uh, so we're always excited about that here. Um, I want to take uh, some time this morning in, in, in my opening remarks to share a little bit more about who we are, who I, who I am, uh, who my team is. I want to talk to you a little bit about our community wealth building journey here in the city of Chicago and close out my opening remarks with just some uh, quick lessons learned that we're gleaning at this stage of our work. And then I'm more than happy to um, answer some questions um, and engage with you all a bit. Um, so I have the honor and, the, uh, and the, the, the challenge, I think, in some ways of being the first ever chief equity officer for the city of Chicago which is beautiful and monumental and transformative in a lot of ways, but also a lot of pressure, if I'm gonna be honest. Um, and in my charge, I lead our Office of Equity and Racial Justice. Um, that was established by our mayor, Mayor Lori Lightfoot, when she first entered into office into 2019. And so I'm really proud to enter into an administration that saw important uh, to create this office, to start off with this office, and, and to really support the growth of this work in the city of Chicago. And my office, uh, the Office of Equity and Racial Justice, which sometimes we call OERJ for short, um, if anybody who's in government knows that we use lots of acronyms, so I'll try to make sure I explain them all, but sometimes I say OERJ for short. Uh, but our office seeks to advance institutional change that results in an equitable transformation of how we do business as across the city of Chicago. That's really important to me. I think that when we talk about equity work, we need to be talking about the whole system. We need to be talking about how we do business, not a program, not just a, an initiative, but really the core work of our institutions and what outcomes and what processes are we using to drive towards those outcomes that create more uh, fair and just results for our communities. Um, and so the how we do this is that we do a lot of work to support our city departments in first normalizing concepts of racial equity, recognizing that the language of equity for lots of folks is something that we have to normalize. Um, we don't always put it on the table. There's a lot of coded language. And so we have to get comfortable talking about it with some real uh, clarity if we are going to work on it in, in, a, in a meaningful way. We also recognize that we have to organize staff to work together for transformational change. And then um, we also have to operationalize new practices, policies, and procedures that result in more fair and just outcomes. And my office, uh, OERJ, has three strategic pillars uh, in, in how we are sort of advancing our strategy to move this work. The first is to support community healing. So recognizing that harm has been done, we do this work in a, rea in a real world where harm has been done, uh, often by the institutions that we are trying to transform. And so we have to create and center healing, um, rebuilding relationships, acknowledging, addressing harm as a core and foundational piece to the work. Right. If we need uh, to support people and people need to take leadership in the work, then we can't bypass the trauma, the harm that has ha often happened. Uh, we have to go through oftentimes a really challenging process of, of rebuilding those relationships. And so centering healing, I think, is an important mechanism for us to do that. The other thing is that uh, in our second pillar is that we need to build restorative tools and partnerships. Uh, to do a new way of business recognizes that we have to have new tools and new ways of doing that. So I often say uh, equity work is innovation work because we have to recognize that oftentimes we are building things that we have not seen before, right? We are trying to drive at results that we have yet to realize. Um, and so we're going to need new tools and new ways to do that. And then the third is that we have to own institutional transformation. 
Um, we have to change the how we do business. We have to think about our institutions, how they work, how they drive, and that anyone who's worked on an uh, organizational change process knows it takes time. Right, um, I, you know, I come from a body of work around schools and what we would often say is to implement like an organizational change effort, it typically took three to five years. But when you're talking about something as expansive as equity and, and, and decades of disinvestment, you have to really think about how much time you're gonna take, even as you are advancing the work as, as, as sort of focused and as rapid as you possibly can. And so when I think about our work around community wealth building, I, I really see it fitting into the second pillar of our work, um, which is building those restorative tools and partnerships. I believe community wealth building offers us a different way for us to create uh, equitable, drive, create and drive equitable economic development in, in our work. And so I wanna tell you a little bit about that journey um, it, this work really started for us uh, back in the fall of 2019. So when our mayor, Mayor Lightfoot, stepped in, one of her, her first focus and really her, her probably, you know, most significant focus has been on addressing the decades of disinvestment that has existed in our city. Um, Neil mentioned, uh, and I think uh, maybe Sarah also said it, Chicago is a very segregated city, right? Um, and there's a deep history of segregation. There's also attached to that a deep history of disinvesting in communities by geography. Uh, for Chicago, we often call it's the South and West Side, which in many ways is synonymous to, with Black and Brown communities. Um, and the mayor, when she stepped into office, really made a commitment to say, we are going to start trying to right that ship. That means we're going to focus and drive a lot of our investment into the south and west sides of, of the city. Um, but one of the things we were charged to do in our office was to really think about what does it take to really drive equitable development. Um, it is not just taking our, our economic development tools and putting them in the South and West Side and hoping that they will work the same way that they have worked for other communities, right? What must be different? What must we think about? Um, and so uh, to, to start this journey, um, I convened a team of about 10 people. It was a combination of the mayor's office, city departments, and a few external partners. And together, we narrowed our focus um, um, and on some shared ownership models that allowed residents to uh, co-own and co-control assets in their communities. I will also be remiss if I don't add, we had the benefit of uh, having a wonderful team member join us, uh, Neka Unwazarike, who brought a wealth of knowledge around thinking about um, uh, equitable development, particularly community wealth building. And it really was through her leadership and our support of, of our, 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 our initial thinking that we really began going down a path toward um, uh, community wealth building. And so by the summer of 2020, um, we spent much of that summer really diving into research and frameworks. Um, and we were grateful in many ways that of all of the work that the Democracy Collaborative had already done, because that allowed us to tap into this rich set of research that they had done that really allowed us to shape our early thinking um, in those days. Um, in addition to that, our office interviewed more than 80 local and national community wealth building stakeholders to really define and customize our strategy. Uh, in the spring of 2021, our office convened a 30 person working group to help us align on goals and outcomes and to come up with policy recommendations for what this could look like for us as a city and particularly at the moment in which we were in. Uh, in July of 2021, our office in partnership with that with our working group hosted a community wealth building convening to really bring our partners together to share our insights, to present on our recommendations and really outline a path forward uh, that we could take together as a city. Um, it, we again were uh, very grateful to be able to partner with the Democracy Collaborative that also came in to interview key stakeholders for us and advise our office on what institutional changes were really necessary to accelerate our community wealth building agenda and maximize our impact. 
Um, this met us at a really powerful moment. Um, it was the same moment in which uh, ARP was coming down to cities. And so in November 2021, we were poised to really have the mayor make a, a historic commitment of $15 million to advance a community wealth building pilot project in, uh, in our 2022 budget. Uh, using dollars from, from, we built our plan called the Chicago Recovery Plan, which incorporates dollars from, from the ARP funding from the federal government. Um, so uh, our $15 million project pilot, we're, we're very excited about it. We are now uh, in implementation phase and our pilot has uh, three goals. The first is to build and support the ecosystem. Um, so we recognize in Chicago that Although we might be starting this work in government, that doesn't mean this work just got started in Chicago when we just, when we started it. So, um, you know, and, and much of that, um, the working group was really a, um, a, a real resource to us to talk about what is the ecosystem all right, that already exists in Chicago and how could we invest in it to strengthen it. And so uh, through this funding, we're able to fund various technical assistance providers that help start and sustain and scale community wealth building models. By way of example, legal and advocacy organizations, co-op incubators and others. Um, our second goal is to strengthen the pipeline. So uh, whereas we want to see this work come to fruition, we recognize that this is a pipeline. Some folks are just starting this journey. Uh, some folks need to, Think about scale. What is the opportunity to scale things up? And so really recognizing that there is a pipeline of building out this work and how can the re financial resources that we're able to provide through this grant support early planning and, pre and the pre-development stage. And then the third is invest in large scale pilots. So we do think it is important to prove to our city, to prove to our city stakeholders, the power of community wealth building and being able to partner with some later stage projects some larger scale projects to really prove up and create that proof of concept to show that this works. Um, you know, this is, this is work that, that is possible. This is work that is real and this is work that has real impacts. And so I will close up my initial remarks with just uh, three quick lessons learned. Um, we're, as you can tell, we're still very much on our journey, but we're very excited about all of the progress that we've made so far. And, but we're also conscious of what we're learning along the way. And so the first lesson is just, you know, recentering around the power of community led initiatives. Um, it is a value and that we center local community leaders and practitioners in this space, particularly local Black and Latinx grassroots leaders. And so to prove up that value is a continual uh, test, right? Um, that is not always how the way, the way the world naturally works. And so we have to be mindful even as we value that, that we actually bring that to our practices. And it, there are times in which we move too fast and, 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 and sometimes our communities have to call us in. And so really centering around that value and supporting one another to make sure that that is true. Um, the second lesson is the importance of narrative change in education. So we have to recognize that this is language oftentimes that is not uh, used or well understood by most. Right, when we say wealth, uh, we find that people often think 10 different ways if there's 10 different people. And so the power of centering narrative, of, of defining things, of building education, um, and really creating a space for stakeholders to learn, to embrace the concepts is, is, gonna, is critical to this work and to really define and show people the possibilities to expand their sense of imagination around this work um, is critical. And then last but not least is something we constantly say in our work, which is that the status quo is not neutral. Um, we have to recognize that how, we, how things are today are creating the exact conditions that we see today. And so if we say we want something different, it is affirmative work. And so community wealth building, I think, gives us a powerful vehicle for a systems change initiative to make our economy more sustainable and trust uh, and just. And so we lean into this at recognizing that we must advance, we must actively advance, we must 
bring new models, new energy, new resources to the work um, if we want to see different results. And so I'll, I'll just close by saying I'm truly excited about this work. Um, I wasn't, I did not know much about community wealth building before I started this role. It is through the partnerships of our community members, the uh, expertise and the dedication of the Democracy Collaborative, and then our, our you know, fearless uh, leader, Neka Onwazarike, who really has been teaching me. And, 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 and in that, I'm so excited about the possibilities for our city. Thanks, thanks, Candice. That's fantastic. Uh, and it's been great working with you. So thanks for all your support and, and helping us to work with you in Chicago. Uh, you mentioned something there about how community wealth bonds are, should be about a different way of doing economic development. I'm just wondering if you could just push you a little bit on the challenges of that in terms of a big city like Chicago and how you kind of turn the wheel or turn the dial, if you like, on how economic development is practiced in the city. Yeah, and you know, I'll be very candid. Um, Good. There is a tension in our city, right? Because um, when the mayor steps in and says, we are gonna address disinvestment, historic disinvestment in, that, in our city, people wanna see things now, right? And they, they feel like, you know, politicians say these things all the time, they never get it done. Um, uh, to be honest, it takes a really long time to move the needle in government. It's a powerful tool, but it can, man, it can be challenging. And so all of that leans towards dusting off old tools and uh, dusting off a plan that you might have and just trying to implement it as fast as possible. Additionally, although I think community knows what it wants, we all are limited by our, often our lack of visibility and imagination around things. And so uh, folks will often accept and or ask for just, uh, you know, slightly tweaked versions of things that they've seen, seen all the time. Uh, but they know and they recognize and, and when we get in conversation, we can talk about how this doesn't fully capture all of the things that they would like to see. But at the same time, that tension around pace and, and, and now it, it, it is real. And so I, I think trying to introduce a new way of thinking or to try to connect people to a different way of thinking about this can be quite challenging, right? Um, and but what I have appreciated is is actually the power of just connecting into there has been a ton of great work in this area right there's a ton of great examples in our communities and so one of the things that we've tried to do is also show our economic development teams that actually these models already exist in some of the things that you are funding the difference is that they've like contorted themselves to match your framework but you could actually, we could actually be more supportive outright to change how we do things, to embrace this and actually get more of these kinds of results. And, and, and we have some great you know, and promising examples of that here in the city. And I think we are really beginning to turn a corner. Now at the same time, those traditional uh, methods are still moving. And so you know, some of it, I just personally think tactically is like, I wanna try to tweak some of those as much as I can, even while I'm trying to build up the, the new and recognize and, and galvanize the momentum that is happening to try to grow what we need to grow in our city. Yeah, fantastic. Um, the chat function is not working on the webinar, but the Q and A is. So please place your questions in the Q and A. And there's one question. If I could just, I've got a few minutes left, Candice, from Kerry Leach, which is a, a good question about: Can community wealth bond be community led? Now, obviously, it can. The experience of Chicago, but what's the balance between being community led and, if you like, city led? And how do you manage that balance of where the energy is, if you like? Yeah, I mean, it certainly can be and is in many ways community led. I think when we think about the city, though, you know, it is it, it the way I think about it, it is the worthy of the partnership of the city. Right. And it's worthy to be embraced by the city. And there are roles that the city can play to really help move the work. The city often can be a, a you know, you know, as challenging as it is, sometimes it is a neutral convener, right? It is a way to connect communities uh, that don't have the 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 reach and the in the scale yet 
to really think citywide. They may only be able to think community-wide because that's a set of resources that's where they're most proximate to. This work shouldn't sit at odds with one another. I think there are challenges to think about how they are mutually supportive, um, how we can make sure that the community-led initiatives have what they need to continue to flourish, that they become experts in the buildup of citywide strategies, and but that the city actually owns its responsibility to really be thinking across the, the entire landscape and to think about all of the institutions and in ways that it can influence and actually own its part and responsibility to the work. And so I think there is a partnership to be achieved um, um, and we shouldn't think about these things um, as, as fundamentally at odds with each other, even though that in practice, sometimes you gotta do some work to get them in alignment. Yeah, it's all about that sort of traditional mainstream top down approach to economic development that so bedevils our cities. And I think that is what you're sort of seeking to overcome in Chicago. Hey, Candace, thanks very much for your time. Uh, you, uh, I know you've got to go and your eloquence is always your clarity and keep up the good work and hopefully see you soon. So thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you. All, thank you all for your partnership in this work. And um, I appreciate it. Yeah. Ciao. Thank you, that. Thank you, Candice. Um, great. We've got some great questions coming in the Q&A, and I'll, we'll pick up some of those with the other speakers. They're great. So keep, keep firing them in, and I'll, I'll select uh, what looks like good ones uh, as we go forward. So over to another uh, area we've been working with and person we've been working with. Uh, we're going to go to Hilary Abel, who is the chief officer, uh, co-founder and chief Policy and Impact Officer at Project Equity. So, Hilary, uh, if you're there, the floor is yours. Thank you, Neil. I'm here. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, it's wonderful to be here with the Democracy Collaborative and colleagues from Meadsville and Chicago and all of you listening from around the country and possibly the world. Um, so, again, my name is Hilary Abel, and I have the distinct honor of having had a few decades of this work under my belt. Um, since about 2003, I've been fully focused on developing worker cooperatives and other forms of broad-based employee ownership to help low and middle wage workers have quality jobs and the opportunity to build truly family-sustaining wealth um, and voice in their workplaces and become part of a democratic economy that can help inform our dem democracy more broadly, which as we know is so needed today. Um, and I've also had the pleasure of um, spending a brief time in Cleveland supporting the Democracy Collaborative's work with the Evergreen Cooperatives um, way back when in the early years, and um, also being part of Project Equity, uh, that which we launched in 2014. And as part of that, over the last couple of years, I've been helping to support a group of uh, multi-stakeholder um, advocates uh, under the leadership of Emile Durrett from Alameda County Social Services Agency, who are starting the Alameda County Community Wealth Building Initiative. So I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking with you all about Alameda County's journey within um, community wealth building, how the Democracy Collaborative has helped, and then zeroing in on, on my area of experience, which is employee ownership. I'll talk a bit more about what's happening in our county around employee ownership and then uh, pull back a bit more to, to the interests of this audience and in community wealth building and other places and speak a little bit about the task force that the Democracy Collaborative is, is setting up. So here in Alameda County, and I've, I've lived in Oakland for 25 years and have been able to witness and participate in an, a very interesting evolution of community wealth building here. As, as you may know, um, Alameda County is the, the East Bay of the San Francisco Bay Area. So some of the best known cities are Oakland and Berkeley. Um, and we are a, a region of great innovation as evidenced by you know, cultures as distinct as the original tech epicenter of the world, Silicon Valley, which is actually in the Southern part of Alameda County, but more famously across the Bay on the peninsula and in the South Bay in San Jose. Um, but as diverse as that tech innovation world to the amazing community self-determination work of so many community organizers and progressive luminaries who are really too many to name in our county over decades and probably centuries. Uh, since the 1990s, I have known Alameda County to be a hub of cooperative development, specifically in worker cooperatives, um, and really important innovation that has helped to inform the growth of the worker cooperative 
a movement across the country and also demonstrated some very real, real impact through cooperative development. So one example there is the Arismendi cooperatives named after Father Arismendi Areta in Spain, but inspired by and supported in their, in their launch by the Cheese Board Collective in Berkeley, which is now a, I believe 50 year old, um, a uh, cooperative business with some 50 worker owners who earn well beyond, well above the, the standard wage in the bakery industry. And many of them have been able to buy homes and, and have you know, really sustainable lives as bakery workers in, in the East Bay. And they took their model, um, they offered their model to the founders of Arizmendi who have now created seven bakeries around the San Francisco Bay area, all of which have incredible products. So please enjoy them if you have a chance to come visit um, Alameda County or San Francisco. Um, and they've inspired, you know, sort of an up, upside down franchise like model of cooperative development um, around the world, I think it's fair to say. Um, my own experience was with um, worker cooperative development with low income immigrant women in, in the East Bay in Oakland and around the area. And the reason that I, I founded Project Equity and wanted to be part of the Alameda County Community Wealth Building Initiative is because I saw such incredible impact from co-ownership of small businesses among some of the, our country's most disadvantaged workers. So mostly monolingual Spanish speakers from um, Central America and Mexico. And we measured the impact of their co-ownership and work in the worker cooperatives that we developed in my last organization. The first year we measured it, it was 40% increases in family incomes. The final year we measured it eight years later was 80% increases. So one of the messages I, I, I like to share with folks interested in community wealth building is that there are on hands-on strategies of building community owned or worker owned wealth building businesses that can create truly profound economic impact. And that there's a, a body of decades of experience that we've, um, we have as, as a field to, to offer to that. Um, of course, there's a lot of innovation as well. And some of the most interesting innovation is coming from, you know, things like Chai Fresh Kitchen in Chicago. Sorry, Candice, um, didn't have time to speak to that because it's a really inspiring example happening the last couple of years in Chicago. Um, and also through some of the ecosystem building efforts that you're hearing about today. So in Alameda County two years ago, Emile Durrett, who's a senior manager at the Alameda County Social Services Agency, started talking to folks who had worked in employee ownership, um, had worked in community land trusts and cooperative housing in the Bay Area, also apprenticeship programs and innovative social enterprise work, all of which was rich here in Alameda County, and said, let's get together and do something to really advance this broader frame of community wealth building that you're all already working under. And over the past two years, we've um, met and established a steering committee for this organization, an organizational home for it, and most important over the past six months, been essentially making the case to Alameda County supervisors that community wealth building is the type of economic development that we desperately need here in the East Bay um, and Alameda County and that the county itself should be investing in. Uh, we're at the stage now where um, the county is considering providing some funding for a planning grant that will enable us to more deeply develop the strategy that will make community wealth building in Alameda County bigger than the sum of its parts. So we're in a unique situation where um, organizations like Project Equity, which I co-founded in 2014, um, now Prospera is the name of the organization I used to work for, but they're, they're still going in the East Bay doing co-op development with immigrant women. Um, and the many organizations that are doing um, community land trusts and innovative housing development like the East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative. Um, so all of these things have been going now for, for five years, 10 years, 15, 20 years, but the connective tissue between them has, has been very, very uh, thin, if you will, you know, basically just relationships between people involved. And the, the case, the opportunity that we have now is to start to build true connective tissue and to figure out how to turn this into a broader economic development strategy. Um, the Democracy Collaborative has been helping us over the past year, bringing their outsider set of eyes, but insiders to the community wealth building field, which has been invaluable to us. They conducted a series of interviews with diverse sets of stakeholders representing everything from you know, local government um, leaders to local anchor institution leaders to you know, folks like myself who are working on the ground in one of the dimensions of community wealth building. They also brought in capital 
Um, and the perspective that the Democracy Collaborative is being, bringing from being able to look at all of that data from these various perspectives with a set of fresh eyes, not, not from inside the community, but from outside, has been invaluable and bringing some of the lessons from places like Preston, England and the work they've been doing in Chicago to help us step back and look at, you know, where do we think that the key leadership is gonna come to really up the ante on this as a strategy for economic development? How are we gonna build the, the connective tissue between a, a workforce strategy, a, um, an employee ownership strategy, a community owned housing strategy. You know, I've, I've learned very well that even though we've seen tremendous success in our work at Project Equity, transitioning businesses in Alameda County and, and elsewhere, we're a national organization actually, but based in, in Oakland, um, we've seen that, you know, organizations that have gone from being, you know, a 10 year old pizzeria or a pair of two pizzerias that we helped become a cooperative um, called A Slice of New York. This cooperative has, is now five years old as a co-op, 15 years old as a business and has shared um, almost $700,000 worth of profit sharing with their 30 some employees in the company over the last several years. So that's truly profound and especially during COVID, but even aside from that to, you know, many of these folks want to move out of their parents' house or want to be able to, you know, take the vacation they've dreamed of but never had the money to be able to do with a high cost of living in the Bay Area or want to invest in, in education or, or saving for a home. So we know that with high cost of housing and all of the challenges of, of land speculation, appreciation, gentrification in the Bay Area, um, we can't look in isolation at a quality job separate from you know, land ownership or a stable housing um, or some of the other issues that are related to community wealth building. So I'm just about um, up on my 10 minutes, but I'm gonna briefly comment on um, some of what we have been doing in Alameda County around employee ownership. Uh, Project Equity has worked for three years with the city of Berkeley, and they have been our laboratory where we've developed a, a formula that we're now using in, in six cities and counties in different parts of California and the country. Um, I can go in, into detail later if we have time, but the, the key parts of it are awareness raising, starting in on narrative shift, educating about the need for transitions of successful businesses to employee ownership as their owners retire, uh, the silver tsunami of, of retiring baby boomers and many businesses that are closing or wealth that's being consolidated uh, because of, of those retirements. Um, we've, we've transitioned five businesses in Berkeley to uh, worker cooperatives in the last uh, three years that we've been working with the city. We have um, educated city uh, leaders, our other partners in the project like the Sustainable Economies Law Center have helped the city remove some barriers and create some visibility for worker cooperatives by doing some relatively simple things like putting cooperatives as a checkbox on the business registration form for the city. Um, and we're now at the point where the city is considering allocating on an ongoing funding stream as part of their budget to continued work around employee ownership, which is really that embedding work that can make community wealth building stick in the long term. Um, so I'll, I'll just wrap by quickly saying that um, we are very excited to be part, uh, my colleagues and I are to be part of the task force that um, the Democracy Collaborative is setting up as they launch this next phase of their community wealth building work. Um, I am absolutely thrilled as someone who's been in this field for about 20 years to see the, the new efforts over the past, you know, two to five to 10 years, there is such a growth, um, you know, about a tripling of the worker cooperatives in the country over the last um, 20 years. In the last 10 years, I would say the, the number of communities taking on community wealth building and the number of um, local governments taking things like employee ownership seriously has grown dramatically. And the, the unique opportunity we have in this time is to begin to, I, I think, um, uh, Candace spoke to it so well in that you have the nascent efforts and the new folks coming into the space. And our movement is very, very racially diverse, actually, in the worker cooperative space, um, much more so than it was 15 or 20 years ago. And there are new entrants who need to be supported and encouraged and be in leadership of, of these efforts. And there are also experience providers um, Whose, whose experience can really help to accelerate the early working communities where they're just getting started. 
So I, I jokingly say, and I don't mean it um, the way it sounds, but it's a, it's a funny phrase for those of us of my generation, you know, don't, don't try this at home. <laughs> Mom always said, don't play ball in the house. Um, so I, I do recommend that as folks are getting started on a community wealth building journey that they um, learn from and be in dialogue with um, folks like the, the folks that um, Democracy Collaborative has come convened for this task force. So that, so that those folks who are quote unquote experts on the task force, and I use air quotes because I'm a lifelong learner, learner and um, think that humility is the most important thing I can bring to the work. Um, so, so those of us who've been at it a while need to learn from newer folks in the space and all of the communities that are engaged need to learn from each other. So thank you, look forward to more conversation. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Hilary. And, and obviously um, at TDC, we have plans to build up networks around community wealth building, which should facilitate that learning and sharing, which is so important to our movement. Um, I'm going to uh, go straight to uh, Mayor Jimmy Kinder from Meadville, and then we'll have some questions after that. So keep your questions coming, folks, in the, in the, in the Q&A uh, icon, and we'll just go straight over to Jamie. Jimmy Kinder. Jamie. Hi, everyone. Um, Hi. Uh, thank you, Hillary. I was going to say you segued that perfectly because I am that baby. Meadville is that that new place, right? And we we are fledgling, right? Like we we are just learning. Um, we aren't learning how how the system works because we we are a product of that. We know what is going right now doesn't work, right? Um, and and so we need something new. Um, I'll introduce myself. Quickly, my name is Jamie Kinder, and I, I am the new mayor here in Meadville. Um, I um, am in a town that that is predominantly, you know, um, white. I am, in, it, it is, it is not a progressive town, right? But but what me being here shows is that that uh, the people here were willing to. They want a change. They voted for a change. They they need something. We are we are lacking in something, and and. Um, so, so what what I see that is 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 um, the fact that that we don't we haven't been planning for the people who live here, right? Um, we don't have a democratic economy. Um, we have been run forever. Um, I wish you guys could see the wall of mayors outside of my office, so you could see what I mean when I say we have been run forever by the same people and the same families doing the the same thing, right? That doesn't work for for us. Um, so. Uh, in a town of 13,000 people, right? And and we are small town USA. Um, for for us, um, we have to. We need a new perspective. Every town has a, a a fringe group of people that are are working hard for change, right? Um, that that have these new great ideas and that they, they are pushing um, because they understand what's going on, right? We have people here um, who are doing big things. Um, we have organizations like um, Common Roots, who is, is working really hard at helping to house people and, um, and to build equity for people, right? That would not have it uh, before. Um, we have um, a group of people, and it, it just so happens a lot of the same people, right? That are working um, and having an investment co-op, right? That is giving people the, the opportunity to own here, right? A small portion of something bigger, right? Um, and, and, and so that that is people's buy-in, but but what does that do for everybody? And how do we make that that larger, right? How do we all get accepted uh, into that? How do we all know about it, even, right? Because because even knowing about it is is a barrier for for the the population, right? Like like people up here, people who have um, always know when the meetings are, always know what's going on, always have the opportunity to invest, and then it's the rest of us, right? And those are the people we plan for in our in our towns, and and um, even though the backbone of our towns are these people down here, right? These are the ones that keep our, our stores open because they can't get to other towns to buy. These are the people that that buy here, that work here, that rent here, that um, pay their bills here, right? They're the ones that are keeping our towns rolling and keeping our towns going, um, and and they're the ones we we never plan for. So um, I just, you know, um, how, how do we change that and how do we change our town? I'm going to speak to a little bit how, how the democracy, the democracy collaborative will help us, right? Again, this is a new partnership. Um, so 
they came in, the Democracy Collaborative came in and they and they researched us and they did gave us a report, right? That is giving us uh, legitimacy for the work because we are a divided city, like like our country, right? And and if if we don't have that legitimacy, they will label us very quickly, right? They will label this work, right, as radical. They will label it as socialism, and it's not, right? Like so, we need the Democracy Collaborative to come in and legitimize the work, to, to give us proof of what has worked and what can work, right? We need you guys to give us concrete plans and ideas. Um, we can't go off half cocked and, and try everything, right? We don't have the time because honestly, this is urgent, right? This is work that needs to be done now, right? I don't care if they call it radical. I don't care what they call it, but we know what's not working and we know that it is creating people to leave our town. And we've seen that town before, right? We've seen small town USA that is, that is it, it, it's desolate and it's desperate, right? And, and Meadville isn't there yet, but we'll get there if we don't change, right? If we don't change and start working for each other and start working together. So, so uh, that's what the Democracy Collaborative has done for us. And with that legitimacy, it will, it, it will make this, this idea and this work nonpartisan, right? We have a convincing argument here. We have a convincing plan. Um, and I, I wanna thank you guys for that because if I just came out and said it, 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 it would be, they'd have fought it from the beginning and we'd never get it done, right? But, but you guys have come with, with years and years of, of proof and work right? Hard work that's been done and you fought that fight already and, and we are happy to ride your coattails, right? And, and, and move in with you. So um, we, we do appreciate that, that part um, and um, appreciate everything that you guys have done. Um, so so what, is, what can Meadville do to move forward? And um, so what we're going to do is we're going to support this initiative as a city, right? I, I heard somebody say, can it be just community led? It can be you know, there, there's a lot of community that wants this, right? And we are asking people, we are talking to people, the people who live here, and they want equity and they want a buy-in and they want to be a part of, of the shared assets here, right? They want to also be able to spend more and live better. And this is the only way we can do that. So, so Meadville, the city, um, where I am, who I am as the mayor um, and our city council, um, we're gonna we're gonna support these initiatives. We're gonna support these efforts, and we're gonna we're gonna um, move forward with them. Um, and then what? Uh, and and you need that. You need that city um, buy-in. Otherwise, it's not gonna go anywhere. Um, not not in a place like this. Um, and and the real challenge is is gonna be are, are the people that are against us, right? They're going to fight really hard. Not because it's not a good thing. Just because we said it. So. Um, Again, that's what where we're gonna fall back on you guys. We're gonna say, well, it worked, right? Like, like it worked, and 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 these are the people that are doing it. And it's not just in in Cleveland and and in California, right? It's in other countries. And so um, we will be leaning hard, hard on you guys, and we will be asking for help, and we will be asking for um, um, your your uh, opinions and your help. Um, I'm not sure where I am on time here. Am I getting close? Neil, you're on mute. Oh. <laughs> you're, you're, get, you're getting close, but yeah, okay. final okay, close so, marks, go for it. Yeah, so um, I just have a couple things things to say for, for us and for anyone else thinking about this, right? Like this is, and, and I don't mean to sound so dire, right? But it is dire and it is urgent. Um, and, and we need to do this with, you know, um, we, we need to do this now um, for, for the sake of our country, our cities, our people, um, uh, or we will fail. Um, it is, it, it is, it's okay to be new and it's okay to start now, right? Like reach out and start now, start today. You have to start somewhere, right? We don't, we don't wanna see these small towns fail because they, they thought they missed the boat, right? So, um, that's kind of where I'm going to leave it. I know I'm, I'm, you know, all over the place here, but I'm excited um, and I'm thankful for, for the work you guys have done and uh, to be a part of this, this initiative and be able to bring back to 
to my people because I am, I am the mayor, but I'm also at poor, like, like poor, right? I am the people that will, will benefit from these programs. I represent them, not just Meadville as a mayor, but as a people, as a black woman, as a single mother, as, as, you know, somebody that, that, that needs help, that, that, um, falls on, on the kindness of others to survive and, 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 and be successful. So, um, thank you for having me. And, um, I, I am just really honored to be in this room. Well, thanks, thanks for thanks for thanks for thanks for being you, Jamie, and thanks for all your work you're doing in Meadville, and it's been a pleasure working with you. I've got one general question from me to both of you. I've got about 10, 15, 10, 15 minutes. Um, one general question. I'm going to pick up a couple of questions from the from the question and answer uh, chat. But what as Sarah talked about, you know, inclusive and democratic enterprises, locally rooted finance, fair work just use of land and property and progressive procurement and how our wedge idea, it's about all of those coming collectively together. Just Hillary and Jamie, how important is to not break out of our own sort of progressive silos like employee ownership or, or community land trust and start to think about the whole suite of activity as, as we do in community wealth building. Do you want to give some thought to that, Hillary? How important is to start thinking across the whole suite of activity? I do think it's very important. It's sort of like the think globally, act locally phrase. Sure. <laughs> I, I do think that it's incredibly helpful for us to, all of us in this work to, to reframe economic development as community wealth building and to bring that, that lens. Um, I'm also uh, an old friend once called me a practical visionary. <laughs> I, I like to think big. I like to, I want to change systems. I, I truly feel that's what we need to be doing. Um, and I also really believe in the in the concrete demonstration projects and then the replication of those and the improvement of those and the scaling of those, as well as the broad framing. So I am a big fan of, um, you know, digging in somewhere. You know, it, I think in, in Cleveland, the, the demonstration impact of the Evergreen Cooperatives has been extraordinary. And there are other ways that we're demonstrating ways that anchor institutions can support community wealth building. There's some new strategies emerging. Um, there is, you know, creating employee owned enterprises. There's creating um, community land trusts or, or cooperative housing. And, there, and there's more than that. Um, but I do think it's important that new efforts be anchored in some real change because people really need to see uh, the impact and the value. Um, and to do that, not divorce from the broader framing. And part of what's so exciting to me about the pairing of this conversation of end to end of your work right now at the Democracy Collaborative is to have communities where community wealth building is, is new, like Meadville, um, to have a place like Chicago where it's not new, but there's this large effort happening and a place like Alameda County where their, their roots of you know, 20 years or more for each of the components of community wealth building, but we haven't yet made it into something that's bigger than the sum of its parts. And that's what we have to do now. So, so I, I'll give it a both and. I'll say, if you'd have to choose one, I would say do something really concrete that's gonna change some people's lives first, but do it with this broader vision and build toward the broader vision. Yeah, very, very sensible. I think that's right. I mean, we need to get those examples, don't we? Those epiphanies of possibilities and then scale them. Uh, it, it echoes our co-founder, Gar Alprovitz, and, and his evolution reconstruction idea of how we change America and build justice. So excellent stuff. Jamie, anything, what would you like to say to that in terms of this important to have all these things brought together as one effective strategy? And obviously Meadville's moving in that direction, I think. Well, um, for me, I guess, you know, I'm, I'm a big picture type of person also, right? Without, without that goal, um, you can think you've made it right without finishing. You know what I mean? Um, I'm often telling people that me being in office is it, it, we didn't make it. We're at the finish or we're, we just started. We're at the starting line, right? We're not. So it, without a big picture, without these big goals, right? And, and all aspects, we're a table with three legs, right? You do two things and then they fall and they crash because we haven't followed through on, on all of these aspects. Right. So um, yeah. for me, you have to follow through. You have to have that big picture in in your head as to where you're moving to, because if there's not a goal, you know, it, it's easy to get derailed. It's easy to get smoke screened and um, people to get you off topic. So you stop the work and we we we're, we don't have that privilege anymore. 
we're at a time where we don't get to sit back and relax. We have to do the work because I, I, I have to tell you, I feel like we have to change the world or we're not going to make it. It's like a fight. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I, I, and I, I do apologize as I know that's emotional, but we, this is the work that is going to change people's lives and people, you know what I mean? And, and people are, are where it's at. You're, you're only as good as your people. You are judged by your poor. And if we are, we don't start doing the work, we, we just, we're going to, we're going to crash and burn. Yeah, no, uh, you know, I say, you know, an old punk phrase, anger is an energy, you know, we need to use that emotion, you know, we, there is too much pacificity uh, and sitting back, we've got to use that emotion, don't never apologize for emotion, it's right, we need to get angry, uh, and control our anger, of course. Um, and there's, there's a couple of questions from the chat that really interest me, one for you, Hilary, it's from Dennis Olson, who says, can you speak to collaboration with unions and worker ownership? And community welfare is a great question, Dennis. Thank you for that. And sorry, I can't 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 hear you. But the, yeah, Hilary, any thoughts on that? Absolutely. Thank you, Dennis. I really appreciate that question. Um, I think there's an immense opportunity for for unions to help drive scale and faster uptake of employee ownership, and. We're seeing some really interesting activity um, coming from union partners and in collaboration with union partners right now in the employee ownership space. Um, one example is an, a company called Allied Up here in California, and it was started primarily by a very large healthcare workers union of allied healthcare workers who are the folks like respiratory therapists and physical therapists, the folks who aren't your primary healthcare providers, but who provide critical health services and usually are not employed directly by hospitals or clinics. They're often um, you know, either temporary or, or long-term outsourced labor. Um, and Allied Up is a worker-owned cooperative of unionized um, allied healthcare workers that has already grown. I think they launched, um, I think it was this January, if I'm recalling correctly, of 2022. And I think they're already up to several hundred uh, worker owners. Uh, because it is a platform cooperative, a staffing agency, it can scale more quickly um, than the sort of more brick and mortar or sort of typical small and medium-sized enterprises that are worker owned that I'm, I've am i been working with. Um, so, so that's an incredibly ambitious and important um, effort led by a union. Um, and there are a number of unionized worker cooperatives. There always have been, uh, but there is a growing movement of unions and um, employee ownership advocates and, and cooperative developers working together, which I think is gonna be very helpful in, in growing the space. And I just wanna say that I so appreciate Jamie's words. Um, and in particular, I'm gonna take away today, it's dire and it's urgent. And I couldn't agree with that more. So we need, you know, major players. The union movement is is having a resurgence, even even as it shrunk over decades. It's been an incredibly important representative of workers in this country. So, it's it's one sector um, of many that we need, but that can really help to grow uh, workers' ownership of enterprises. Thanks, Hilary. Excellent answer and reply to Dennis. Um, Jamie, there's an anonymous attendee's question, which is a good one, uh, 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 Mr. or Mrs. or Ms. Anonymous. Does Community Wealth Bond have bipartisan support? And if not, could cross-party coalition be built? I'm intrigued. I know a little bit about Meadville. I, I'm intrigued about how that plays out in Meadville. So um, unfortunately, everything here is divided, right? Um, yes. Yes, we can create um, a coalition to build bipartisan support, and that that's only that can only come because uh, the Democracy Collaborative ha has been involved, right? It couldn't have come if we would have tried to do this alone. And I, I'm I'm saying that because even these fringe organizations that are doing these this beautiful work, this this big work, um, are are being pushed and stopped at every corner, not because they are taking from anyone, right? And I feel like Meadville sees all of this stuff as a pie. And if we take a little more on this side, they get less when it's two pies, right? It's not, it's not the same thing. So um, it, it's, it's they're holding on to power here. And we are an affront to that, um, to, to be honest. And, you know, they're, they're, they're holding on so hard that it's, they're not, understanding what they have to gain by doing this, by people having more, by people being able to spend more, by people 
having more buy-in to their, their community, right? So yes, I think we can make this a uh, 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 nonpartisan issue. I think with, with hard work, we can do that. And there'll still be, you know, a faction that we're not going to reach because that's how, that's how life is. Right. Um, but I think that, that this is, this is a, um, this is a plan and this is a, a, an idea, and this is a strategy that everybody can get on board to once, once they think about it. And once they have a couple of people that they know that are on board, right? Like that, that's what, that's what we have to work for. So, so yes, a coalition would be wonderful. And, and I'd be so happy to be a part of that. Yeah, that's great. And now the chat function is working. Hurrah. And I love the point you made. I think you've been talking new com the new common sense there. And I think that's a really, really thing we're looking for. Just push us one, one another question from an anonymous, anonymous attendee. He says, does Meadville have any specific initiatives that are percolating up? I'm assuming that's starting to build things at scale. And is there anything you, that comes to mind there, Jamie? New, new initiatives. Well, uh, again, I mentioned like Common Roots. I mentioned the investment co-op. I mentioned, um, well, and, and we even have a, a, a company, CNJ, that, that sold to its employees. And it was like one of the first ones here, right? And it was a beautiful thing. And people were very, very, very excited. Um, and, and it's working beautifully, right? Um, again, all of those things are on the fringe. Um, we've got big ideas, right? Like, like we want our anchor institutions to get involved. We want them to buy here. Because often yeah. we say, hey, hey, Jamie, shop local, right? Jenny, down the street, shop local. But we never uh, hold responsibility to those institutions that could save the half of the businesses in town by just giving them, you know, some business, right? Including the city, right? <laughs> like, we need to make sure that, that these are things that, that we're pushing along with, um, you know, pay rates. Right. And, and I'm telling you right now, I'm ready to hit the ground running on, on asking those, those anchor institutions um, and, and pushing those pay rates, right, right in my town, I will ask them myself. Um, so, uh, again, thank you for this framework. This, this is the work that um, I am passionate about. And my city is, is what I believe in and the people here. So, so I appreciate the Dem Democracy Collaborative. Thanks, thanks, thanks for the thanks for the the, the, the plug. I think yeah, the framework and the, across the five pillars that Sarah mentioned, I think are a, are a good starting point. The action plan is a great starting point to advance your own community wealth building strategies in place. It, there's a question from Matthew Busby, uh, Hillary, um, which is what is the best way to approach local governments to get their attention? And and clearly we have got the attention of Alameda County and. Berkeley and Oakland and others, but I'm just wondering what, what, what you think got their attention initially? Yeah, I, two things. Um, so I have two lenses here. One is Project Equity's experience working with local governments, and that's been specifically on employee ownership. Uh, but what has really worked there is reframing the issue as reframing economic development and small business, you know, economic development as the importance of business retention and really moving away from that classic thing of who gets the next Amazon warehouse. And part of the way we've made that business retention message uh, land is through our data studies where we've been able to show, we've done them across maybe seven or eight localities, no, actually about a dozen localities now. And the pattern is always the same. Essentially what it is, is that um, businesses that are 20 years old or more, so what you might call legacy businesses that have been in those communities for a long time, make up about 20% of the, all the businesses in a community. Um, but they tend to employ, um, I think around 50% or 40% of, um, of the workforce. So, you know, 20% of the businesses in, employing a really significantly outsized percent of the workforce. And then their revenue contributions to the city and the local economy are around two thirds, between half and two thirds. And we've seen that pattern across many localities based on rigorous data studies. So, so reframing and using data has really helped in our work with local governments. In Alameda County, I think it has a lot to do with our, our champions. Um, you know, Emile Durrett, uh, he's a very uh, quiet man, very humble, um, but has the persistence and has really educated 
his coworkers, his bosses in the department that he works in. He's just kind of humbly and with his passion and vision brought many of us together and kept us at the table to do the sort of, in our place, what we need is not the instant spark because we have a lot of sparks already that have been sparked already and work that's been happening, but what we need that careful planning and that really coming together in thoughtful ways. So I, I think leadership really matters and it can come from anywhere. You know, it can come from anywhere. That's that's my favorite thing about worker ownership in my own experience and that of what I've seen of, you know, dozens or probably hundreds of workers as um, sharing ownership can make everybody a leader. You know, you have that voice by definition and it gives you the space to, to dream and to experiment and to step up and lead. Brilliant. We're coming to the end of this question section and I, I'm just thinking just a simple general question to kind of finish to you both. I mean, um, there'll be lots of curious people. I'm interested in the curious people that's popped into this webinar and thinking, well, you know, I'm curious about Cooney Wealth Bowling. How would I start to advance it in my place? Maybe they're thinking, what would you say to them? Whatever you know, can imagine them, maybe a policy person, a politician or an activist. What would you say to them in terms of advancing community Wealth Bowling in their locality, those curious people that might be out there? Any thoughts, Jamie, first of all? Um. You're just asking about the, the people who just just want to know about. Community. Yeah, no, yeah. Just what would they, what would they do in their own place to get community wealth phone started and going? Well, um, I I think first, right, like like um, I have watched every video online and and I have studied you guys, right? Because here I am on a panel of, of brilliant people, and I I want to know, I want to know what you guys are doing. So get out there and look and see what's going on. But but I mean creating these organizations it's not easy and it's slow moving but the work is good and 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 the work the work um it it works the work works so um reach out reach out we're you know what i mean you you now have sat and and listened to a panel of people you know of of the democracy collaborative you know of all of these different organizations right that are pushing this work reach out every single person and everyone that is doing this work wants to collaborate with you, wants to, to give you advice, wants to let you know what, what we're doing and, and how we're doing it and the mistakes we've made, right? Nobody wants you to do that alone, right? Like we, that's the whole point. We're in this together. We're in our communities, but, but this is a global community, right? So, so for me, reach out, let Great. us, let us help you. Great. Thank you. Thanks for that. And Hillary, very quickly, last words yep. for you in this. The only thing I would add is that there might be um, community wealth building organizations already in your community that are less visible. So as Jamie said, they yeah. have a company that had sold to their employees. Um, if you have credit unions, which most communities do, those are our cooperatives, they're financial cooperatives. Um, so start to dig, learn more about your local economy. Um, and couldn't agree more with Jamie, reach out to others who are thinking about it and, and doing the work. Thank, thanks very much. Well, we just coming to the end, just a final few thoughts and just a, a finishing slide that Cyril put up. But but this this is our TDC are here to stay on this agenda. Uh, we've got our ambitious plans to create a network for community wealth building. We're planning on putting on training. Uh, we're planning to having guidebooks. We're going to, have to do policy work. We're going to do research work. We're going to have communities of practice. We've got the technical assistance task force, which Hillary is a part of. This is the start of you know us really putting some uh, 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 grunt, if you like, into the community wealth building movement. So this is just the beginning. We've got other webinars planned as part of that growing network. And Celia, just put that last slide up, if you may, just to flag it up for our attendees. Sorry for the problems with chat, but we got round it on the Q&A and thanks for your forbearance on that. Thanks to all the speakers. Uh, thanks to all you attending. And also thanks, of course, to uh, Celia, and all the other people at Democracy Club that make this such an effective day. Um, here is just, yeah, here we are. We've got webinars coming up. We've got a transatlantic community wealth building session uh, featuring lessons from, and there's a poll there coming up as well, just a little bit, fill that in as you're listening. Um, uh, featuring lessons from Scotland, uh, that's going to be in September. Um, I, I'm actually sitting here in Scotland. Um, uh, bending the ARPA funds and mainstream funding and support of community wealth building is going to be the second sort of webinar. That will be later on in the fall. And digging into the strategies in each of the five pillars of community wealth building. That's land, uh, inclusive and democratic enterprises, locally, uh, uh, locally rooted finance, fair work, 
just use of land and pro property and progressive procurement. So sign up to the upcoming webinars on that uh, uh, site. There's Ted, myself, and my and Sarah's email addresses. We'll have a follow-up email to you, which is a little bit of survey about this event. We always want to learn and make it better moving forward. So fill that poll in. Brilliant. I think we're just about on time. I think that's all. Thank you very much for your time. Bye-bye. See you again soon, hopefully. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, Thanks. everyone, for Thanks, being Hillary. here. Thanks, Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. And thanks, comms team, for your on the fly problem solving there. It wouldn't be it wouldn't be a, a virtual event if that wasn't there. Eh? Thank you again for having me. Everyone have Pleasure. a wonderful day. Thank you, See Jamie. You really we're great. Hillary, really to great. Get, Jamie, we're hoping to get up to Meadville soon. So oh, sometime this end this year. Yeah, yeah, I'm dying <laughs> to get there. But yeah, yeah. That would be great. That will be great. <laughs> good luck, Jamie. It's so great to hear about your efforts. Yeah. Really exciting. Yeah. It was nice meeting you, Hillary, and everyone else. Thank you again. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Much. All right. Thank you.